Okay, so here I am with the uh, cycling hero who's got 20 or so of his favorite photos to talk to. And uh, first up, we've got dipping the tires in the ocean at Havre de Glass, Grace, or whatever it's called, somewhere in Maryland on June the 11th. So, Davo, can you cast your mind back to this picture and remember what you were thinking? Well, uh, that night we'd stayed in a Super 8 motel and it was about four of us per room so no one really slept that much which uh, was good to start off the trip on about four and a half hours of sleep so uh, we all woke up and we were exhausted and we still didn't really know what we were about to do so we uh, we put all the stuff on our bikes and headed down to the water and dipped our tires in and took a bunch of pictures and got ready to leave I think by the time you left, you were pretty ready to go, weren't you? The uh, mums and dads were beginning to get a bit much. Yeah, everyone was. I think the parents were more worried than we were. We didn't really think anything of it until we really got into it and we were like, actually, we're going to be doing this for a lot longer. But um, uh, it was good to sort of leave and actually get going and begin it instead of being worried about what happens if we don't get there or like leave on time or all the little problems that happen before you actually get on the trip. And uh, it was, you did about 30 miles the first day and that was pretty hilly, wasn't it? Uh, the first hill, or as soon as we left, we had an 8% gradient hill, which is uh, pretty large. They have signs warning trucks that uh, they have to change their gears so they can go extremely slow down because they're so steep. But uh, So we had one of those as our first hill, which was kind of a surprise because no one really expected it would be that hard until maybe like the Appalachian Mountains or something but um it was good to sort of get into it and it really did work you for the beginning of the trip. And were you stiff the next day after the first 30 miles? Yeah everyone was really sore and it was just ibuprofen and lots of Gatorade and uh, a lot of people's backs were sore and legs and uh, just from like sleeping on the ground and all that stuff, but uh, it was it was the beginning of a lot more soreness. Okay, so let's move on. So this I think is the leader Brian, um, and his bike jumper didn't seem to fit terribly well. Um, so what made you choose this photo, Dave? Uh, we ordered our jersey about a month or so in advance and we asked for certain sizes and Brian told us that uh, he'd worked with them before and he was sure that they were going to work out right so we all got our jersey sizes and uh, we sent it in and then about a week before we actually left they sent them back to us and we all tried them on and uh, somehow even though that right there is a XL jersey as you can tell it's not very large so uh, we had fun with our tiny jerseys, the actual whole trip. And uh, Brian and Chris, the two leaders, actually ended up not even wearing their jersey at all because it just looks absolutely ridiculous with a what looks like a woman's small jersey with a group of guys. And in fact, you'll notice those people that looked at the DVD of them finishing, you can see that Brian indeed is not wearing his white jersey. He's wearing his orange jersey that had sort of faded to yellow almost. And just tell us a little bit about Brian, because Brian was the main man behind the whole trip, both in terms of training and thinking and planning. You must have got to know Brian pretty well. Yeah, I mean, I've known him before for uh, five or so years, and uh, we'd always been friends, and he's talked about the trips that he'd done before. So, uh, I was, I mean, I like him a lot, and we've had a lot of fun together. And even on the trip, you... He was someone that was always there and helped you at the same time as being like a friend that you could just hang out with and do whatever, but uh, he's a good guy and I like him a lot. I remember he had a bit of a reputation for uh, bending the truth uh, on occasions when it was 20 miles to go, he'd say it's around the next corner, is that right? Yeah, Brian never really told that much truth. <laughs> he, uh, If you ask him how far it is, no matter how far it is, he'll tell you it's three miles. And. Uh, he always tells you that in the next town there may be like a Burger King or something and then you get there and there's not even a grocery store. So uh, he wasn't always too honest, but uh, I guess that also made it a little more exciting. And he's the one that got you up at 6 o'clock or whatever time it was in the morning. Yeah, I, 
if he wasn't there, I doubt we'd ever get up. So he was the one that made sure we all got up and every single morning and got to biking. Okay. So talking of restaurants and food, let's move on to the next one. So this is pretty interesting, David. That looks like a pretty severe weapon with a bayonet on the eye, on the end. Can you talk us through what exactly was going on here? Um, I think this was about day three, and already everyone's bikes were starting to break. Um, I'd been riding down a hill, and two bolts on the back of my bike somehow popped off, and my all my gear was drug across the ground for a little bit. So, uh, and also happened to Matt as well. So we were trying to find spare bolts so we could put our bikes back together and continue riding. So uh, we walked around town to ask people if there was a uh, hardware store or anything, and the only thing they said they had was a gun store, and maybe we'd be able to find something there. So we went in, and I had a look around to see if I could find any, and I found some of the most ridiculous guns that you could ever find that I don't really know who actually buys. But uh, So I decided to get a picture of Small Town America in the little gun store. So what did happen generally when uh, a lot of people have asked me, you know, so things happen to the bikes. There aren't bike shops in every small town in America. What, did you, how did you hold it together till you got to a bike shop? Um, there really aren't that many bike stores at all. So when you go through a town of 300, they may have a hardware store and you just walk around and take out a bolt that you know you need and then walk around until you find something like it or just make up something, I don't know, we use sticks and tape and glue and everything to keep our bikes together, but uh, I don't know, it sort of made it exciting. Okay, let's go on to the next one. So this appears to be a Bob Evans restaurant. What's the uh, story here? Um, we got up extra early again this morning and uh, it was just kind of a usual day, 60, 65 miles, so uh, we headed out and it was pretty hot, so no one was really too excited to get biking. And uh, lunch was about another 40 miles away, so people were like, they didn't want to go to uh, have a big breakfast because they knew they'd be there for a couple hours and then they'd have to be biking in the heat all the way to lunch, which was 40 miles away. But uh, me, Daniel, Adams, Matt, and Kit decided that uh, instead we think we may have a Bob Evans instead and just enjoy ourselves instead of trying to get to lunch as soon as we could. So we ordered, we all got these huge breakfasts and just hang out with the waitresses. And uh, actually at the end they said that they would like to pay for our meal because of what we were doing. So we got a free meal, which we were so excited we biked as hard as we could for the next 45 miles just so we could tell everyone that decided to have a granola bar instead and head on to the next town. So it was the first of the free meal sort of uh, tricks where you try and talk people into <laughs> letting you eat for free. What was the uh, favorite chain that you used to go to or the favorite restaurant? Any any of them stand out? Um, I think the favorite restaurants were the ones that weren't chains. They're just like little um, restaurants that uh, one some guy decided that he wanted to start up so he gets like a group of friends and then sort of makes a burger joint. So they're uh, I like the ones that are like the small town ones that you've never heard of before, like Bob's Burger Place or something like that. They were always real good. Very good. Let's move on. So this, I think, is Matt, and he's looking pretty hot. I think on this day it was 99 degrees, breaking 100, and we still had about 10 miles left, and we already knew that everyone else was ahead of us because we'd stop for breakfast again this is a different day but we also stopped to get donuts at this place so um we were all behind and it was incredibly hot and uh we walked into the gas station to try and buy a drink but there's nowhere to sit down so we just stood around until the uh gas station owner told us that we had to leave we can't just sit in there so we walked outside and matt found this ice machine um which he decided to pin himself between so he would keep his self cooler than just sitting in the shade or the no shade seeing it was 12 o'clock what was the how it, it got even hotter than that can you remember that the, the hottest it got uh one day we ended up getting at 4 30 because we heard it was going to be over 100 that day and uh finished biking by 9 30 in the morning and um that day we sat inside a restaurant the entire day and watched the um the temperature gauge and saw it go up to 118 degrees. 
that's pretty hot that is pretty hot so this likes a pretty cool sunset and your uh, I guess that's your tent in the f foreground is that right um this is actually when we were staying in a place called Odell. They had a really nice uh, shelter and a pool which they let us stay in. This is actually Chris's tent. He, his wasn't a freestanding tent, which means that uh, it needs to be staked down, which holds it all up. So uh, he always had to set up our, his tent while we could just go underneath the shelter and put our tents up there and not have to worry about rain or anything. But uh, somehow that night, out of nowhere the just changed and went dark real fast and then the most amazing sunset I've seen ever so uh, we took a bunch of pictures and then just hung out and we also met another group of bikers that were biking through every single straight uh, every single state in America and so just every night you were in a tent or did you ever get to sleep in a bed um, I think we slept in a bed maybe five or six times uh, Twice was at Dean's house in Minneapolis, which was a guy that we knew. And then um, there was a couple times where people asked us what we were doing, and then we told them about it, and they were like, I'll come stay in my house. I have room. So we'd go in and stay at their house and take showers and do laundry. So that was always real nice to see people that were willing to let you stay in their house when they have no idea who you are. And quite often you were quite close to trains, weren't you? Yes. Uh, sleeping was never that fun. Um, I don't know how, but there's pretty much a train, uh, a train track that goes through every single town in America, and um, usually the parks are located right next to it because no one wants to build their house there. So you'd be waking up at 2 a.m. in the morning, shaking because the train going by you is so loud and so big that the whole ground around you is just shaking due to the size of it. Must have been good to get back to the bed, back in uh, Rhododendron Drive. Okay, let's move on. So this appears to be a cooler being strapped to the back of the bike with the ubiquitous duct tape. Is that right? Yeah, um, me, Daniel, and Kit decided we were going to be staying in a national park that night, so there wasn't going to be any restaurants or grocery stores or anything. So uh, me, Matt, and Daniel all put our money together and bought a little $2 um, styrofoam cooler and then an 18 pack of Mountain Dew uh, soda so we filled up with ice and we filled up the uh, cooler with Mountain Dews and then strapped it to the back of Daniel's bike and we sort of rode in a little formation making sure no one was trying to steal our Mountain Dews for the rest of the 10 miles and then uh, that night when everyone else was eating their ramen noodles and drinking their disgusting water they just pumped out of um, a tap nearby we opened up our ice cold Mountain Dews and uh, still steaming because they were so cold and it was absolutely amazing I'm sure you shared them with everybody no we biked it there ourselves so a couple people that we may have owed from other things we gave them to but uh, we stuck to about four Mountain Dews each it's pretty <laughs> that, good that, that must have been pretty heavy on someone's bike wouldn't it yeah we uh, switched off um, on whose bike held it for the rest of the way but uh i rode behind daniel to make sure because everyone was talking about how they were going to try and steal our mountain dews as soon as we got there so we rode in sort of like a police line making sure that no one was going to come and take them away from us and mountain dew for those who aren't from the south um it's just a sort of a carbonated lemony drink yeah it's um it's just like a lemon and lime soda that's delicious <laughs> Now, some people will heard, have heard reference of your bent forks, and I'm assuming this picture is of those bent forks. Uh, this is actually the front fork on my bike, which uh, holds the wheel to the frame, or the thing that basically holds your front wheel onto your bike. And uh, on the way to Cleveland, it was raining really hard one day, and um, we were just riding along, and I went to go into to like switch my hands on the handlebars and I slipped off one of my hands and I lost control and ended up hitting a mailbox and uh, flipping over that. I was fine but my bike got a little more screwed up so um, for the rest of the way I had to bike with my front fork slightly bent and which was kind of annoying because the first couple days it was kind of uh, it pulled the wheel to the right a bit so you had to pull it back to the left just to keep it straight so it was sort of a 
is learning how to ride again with a new front fork. But I ended up going to Minneapolis, which is about 300, 400 miles later, and uh, went to a bike store there, and they changed it out for me for a really cheap price because I told them what that I was doing, which was uh, really nice because I'd been warned that it may cost a lot to fix it. So how was the mailbox after the incident? Um, the mailbox is probably as bad as my bike, but I should have taken a picture of it because it was pretty funny. But um, Brian was kind of mad because he thought I was fooling around, so we were just trying to get out of there as soon as we can. And I didn't really want to have to tell the person at the house what happened to theirs. It must have been fairly amusing for that person going to get their post that morning. <laughs> um, 300 miles? You actually went 300 miles with it bent like this? Yeah, um, after a while I, I uh, sat down and I tried to readjust everything just so it would um, work again, but for 300 miles it definitely wasn't working as well as it could have. I can imagine. Now some of you who might have been following the blog about the bicycle tour will have heard about uh, various jumping off bridges and a very famous belly flop done by... Uh, David Benjamin here. I don't think that's this is that belly flop, but uh, what's what's going on here? Uh, when we were riding, sometimes you'd ride for hours and nothing would happen, so you always look for some type of entertainment. So um, frequently we'd ride over bridges, and I just love to jump off bridges. I don't know, it's just something. It's real fun. So uh, we'd always go down and test the water and see how deep it is, and then climb back out, make sure no cars are coming by, and jump off of it. So this was a uh, a bridge, it was on a real hot day, and we had we were about to go into the mosquito capital of the world. So we decided we may just hang out for a little bit before we ride into the, um, a lot of not fun riding. So, Where is uh, the mosquito capital of the world? It's called Seiko, and I'm pretty sure it's in North Dakota. Um, mosquitoes will bite you. Uh, riding as fast as 18, 19 miles an hour. So if you don't want to get bitten, you have to ride over 20 miles an hour, which is very hard to do on flat ground. And didn't you say that they actually bite through the jersey? Yeah, um, they'll bite through your jersey, they'll bite through your shorts, they'll bite through your socks, they'll bite through everything you have, even through your tent if you're touching the wall. They can't get through it, but if you're touching it, they can bite through it. So uh, yeah, you had to go be pretty careful if you live there. Did you get lots of bites? Yeah, um, riding in there was the worst because everyone was tired and then somehow they could keep up with you so you'd riding and they were biting you and you're trying to smack them away from you as well as biking so uh, wasn't that fun. And this isn't the picture of that belly flop but what, what happened? Um, for the belly flop? Yeah. Um, the belly flop was a bridge similar to that except a lot smaller and uh, I tried to do a front flip off but I over rotated a lot and ended up fully on my stomach. And it was pretty painful for the next couple of days? Yeah, I ended up getting a bruise from it, but uh, Brian had it on film, so it was completely worth it. <laughs> so this is one of just what you did for 68 days, I guess? Yeah, I wanted to get a picture to sort of show everyone just what you see day after day after day, riding behind like your friends and just listening to music and I don't know, just enjoying what's around. So this would pretty much be the bike trip for about 40 days. So um, it's just riding, you just look at everything, the clouds and the person in front of you, you've inspected every single thing on the person's bike in front of you and read the jerseys over 40 times a day. So. Uh, and out of interest, what was a typical, I know they were all different, but a typical day? Um, a typical day, we'd get up at about six o'clock We'd go to a gas station and grab a drink and some sort of uh, breakfast item and then um, be biking by 7. We'd ride to about 12 or something before getting lunch and then ride for another 3 hours and be done by about 3, 4 o'clock where we just set up camp and hang out and do whatever we want. And what sort of speed did you average? Um, I think on days like this, you average about only 11 or 12 miles an hour just because there's no point trying to push it and if you do it just gets you tired and you're only a little bit further on so you never really go that much faster than 12 miles an hour on flat but uh, when you're going downhill you can get a lot faster. What was the fastest you went? The fastest I went on the trip was 44 miles an hour. 
You wouldn't want to come off going 44 miles an hour. No, not at all. Now, it's not entirely clear what is going on here, but uh, it was quite an incident, I think. Yeah, we were all, all the Wabu group were just hanging out um, at camp, sitting actually on that hill right there where you see Brian on the far right, and uh, just looking at the lake ahead of us and talking about what we're going to do tomorrow when we heard a bunch of cracking and stuff and we were wondering what that was and Brian was like oh I think that's the tree maybe it's about to fall down so we were like no way so he ran to go get his camera and as soon as he turned around the tree just fell down right in front of us and uh, so he decided to climb on it and check it out it would have been a n not a time to be under the tree I guess yeah it was a pretty large tree as you can tell from Daniel and Kit standing on it and only being a tiny bit of it. Good, well I'll count yourself lucky. Now on the face of it, this is Daniel inside a dryer. What's 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 the story behind this? Um, it really isn't that much of a story. We uh, were at a laundromat and um, we finished drying and then Daniel said, hey I bet you I could fit in this dryer. So he got in the dryer. So how many times did you wash your shirt on the course of the whole trip? Um, we probably, other than like the places we stayed, so in Minneapolis, like when we stayed with people we know, um, we may have washed our clothes five times, so not that often. And you will notice those people have seen the DVDs, it's quite a contrast, the white shirts when they started out in Maryland and the not so white shirts uh, when, when they finished and you didn't actually have that much kit you only had a couple of t-shirts for the whole trip didn't you yeah you pretty much wore the same thing every day you wore the white black jersey the uh, same shorts and then maybe you change your socks every so often but uh, you pretty much wear that every single day and then change into your orange wabu shirt when you're done and then uh, go to sleep and do it again the next day and how many how often did you get to have a shower did the campgrounds have showers um, some people had showers, some people did, they just didn't let you use it. So, uh, we took showers probably on average about every three days or so. Right, so it must have been nice coming home. Definitely. So this is a bit different because this appears to be inside a car and some jubilation. Um, this was at, um, Glacier National Park in Montana. It was near the end. And uh, we rented a car so we could go drive around and um, hang out and see the views, except by non-manpower. So um, we rented a car, and this is just a picture of Matt making fun of someone we know back home driving a car. Imitating somebody driving a car? Yep. And tell us about National Glacier National Park. It's pretty spectacular, isn't it? It's... Um, it was nice, we went hiking, as you'll be able to see on the next couple pictures, there'll be pictures of us hiking and uh, mountaineering, we climbed up a couple of mountains, we went swimming in a couple of lakes, and uh, we did a lot of fun stuff. So this was the longest break you had from biking, you had three days? Yeah. Excellent, looks good. So this would appear to be a toothbrush? Yes, um, at Glacier National Park we... Uh, we well, whenever you have a day off, you have to fix up your bike and make sure it's in working order again. So, um, when you're riding, I don't know how you end up having this much dirt all over your bike, but uh, somehow it gets on there. So you take apart your bike and you take off the wheels and you have to clean all the, like, the chain and all of that. So, uh, this is a toothbrush after cleaning my chain and my bike. So you did all your bike maintenance, the leaders didn't do that? Uh, no, you do everything on your bike. They don't really care what happens to you or your bike. They just tell you you have to make it here. So if you have to make it there after replacing everything on your bike about five times, then that's your problem. Did you have many punctures? Um, it really depends on the area. Sometimes we'd ride on a highway for a couple days and it would just be the worst highway ever where people throw glass out the window all the time. And we'd have up to five punctures a day for every, or not for per person, but total. But then uh, some days we'd go, I don't know, sometimes we go even weeks without everyone having a flat tire, but uh, so it really depends on where you are. Uh, but you, did, did you have many, personally many punches? I didn't until the end of the trip. I think I went um, maybe the first 50 days without getting a single flat tire. 
and uh, everyone was mad because they've had to have changed about six or seven of them and I hadn't had one yet but uh, near the end of the trip it sort of caught up with me and I had a actual blowout which is where your tire pretty much just explodes and you can't really fix it so I had to go buy another tire again after that one. And I remember when you finished it was a pretty fat thick tire which would have been a slower wouldn't it? Yeah um, we all had the same tires when we bought them in uh, Minot, North Dakota but I was riding in some, I guess, huge piece of glass uh, cut my tire so that I couldn't put another, just another tube in it. The whole actual plastic tire was broken, so uh, I had to go buy another one, and they didn't have one the same size, so I ended up having to ride a mountain bike tire, which was kind of hard going up those passes. I can imagine. Okay, Dave, well, this is, um, it was hot on the trip, but this looks like snow. Um, this was in Glacier National Park when uh, we hiked to the top of a mountain on our day off. It was actually pretty high as you can see where uh, with the snow in the background we started a lot further down than that which um, it was about a seven mile hike and it took us a couple hours and it was really fun when we got to the top we just sort of laid and looked at the whole park and looked around and then that in the picture is actually Kit who uh, recently when he got home he was really sick and uh, had to go to the hospital for a couple of days, but he's a lot better now. And um, That wasn't related to the trip, was it? No, but they are. They do say a lot that uh, one of the reasons why he made it through, he was very ill sick, but uh, one of the reasons that he made it through was because he was so healthy, and I'm sure this big mountain helped. Because he was in intensive care, wasn't he? Yeah, for a couple of days. Yeah, okay. And so um, you had a couple of days off at Glacier National Park, and uh, you that's where you hide the car yeah we got a car for three days and we just went around to different places we went to a lake we went to a mountain on the third day we just sort of uh, hung out at our campsite fixed our bikes and got ready for more biking so this is a cool photo what's um, what exactly going on here this was when we went hiking by the lake uh, from left to right, it's Daniel, Chris Allen, and this is the next guy who uh, led our trip, and then me on the right. And uh, this is when we went hiking across to go to different lakes into a waterfall. We ended up going swimming that day, and uh, it was the coldest water I've ever been in. Because <laughs> it is from melted glaciers. Yes, yeah, so it's just runoff from glacier water. But uh, so we hiked, it was a long hike that day, it ended up being about 14 miles. But um, we went to this waterfall, we went swimming, and then uh, we kept hiking around and took a lot of pictures. And you, you're still staying in your um, tent and sleeping bag? Yeah, we had a campsite which is on top of a, it was sort of like on the middle of a mountain, so it was really fun. You get to look out and see all the stuff around you. But um, this was just one of, this was day two of three where we went on a hike. And didn't you at one point have some close encounters with some gnats in your sleeping bag? Yeah, while I was out there, I kept on getting these like little red dots all over me, so um, it, it like sort of mended itself over the day, but then it would get bad again in the morning, so I had to go to a laundromat and wash my sleeping bag and try and make it dry again before that night, so it'd be warm. So somehow the sleeping bag was infested with some sorts of gnats? Yeah, well, we whenever we get to camp, we always like take out our sleeping bag and um, tent and sort of lay it down to dry or to just lay in. But uh, let's put it in the wrong spot. <laughs> now those mountains in the back look impressive. This is still Glacier National Park. This is the same day. It's just uh, probably a couple hours after that last picture. But um, this uh, actually, it's funny when you're biking and you look at this and. See, you'll be saying that's just a road. You'll look and see all those mountains, and you wonder how you're going to get over to the other side without having to go over one of those huge things. So I remember a lot of the time when I was biking, I thought of how you'd look ahead. And usually, like, if you go on a little hiking trip or something, you can look ahead of the mountains and just be like, oh, we won't have to do that. But when you're biking across the country, you know everything you'll see you'll have to go over. So you always think about how you're going to do it or what it's going to be like. And that was always tough. It didn't always make you feel good when you were tired and you saw these huge things in front of you, but uh, it was nice scenery. 
And uh, you went through the Rockies, and, and what other big mountain ranges did you go through? Well, the first one we went through was the Appalachian Mountains, and that was Pennsylvania, which is pretty much the whole thing. And then it flattened out by the time we got to Ohio. And then the mountains started up again in the Cascades. Well, we started off with the Rockies, just like the very tip of them, which is uh, partly what Glacier is, along with the uh, Continental Divide. And then after we crossed the Continental Divide, we had the Cascades, which was five peaks, which you'll see a lot more pictures of later on in the slideshow. And what's the highest Cascade Mountain? The highest Cascade Mountain that we went over was about 6,500 feet or something. And we started off at about one and a half, two thousand 2,000 feet. Wow, that's high. And like you were just saying, Maria's Pass, Continent, Continental Divide, 5,200 feet. Uh, yeah, this was it's actually called Marias Pass. But, uh -huh. uh, this was the first day back from biking, and uh, it was really hard because uh, we had forest fires while we were there. So, um, like, the closer you got into the park, the more smoke there was, and you were trying to breathe really heavily up going up these big mountains, but all you could breathe in was smoke, and it just, I don't know, it made you feel really sick and just wasn't too fun but then we finally got to continental divide and you can turn over your maps and you see that uh from the top of that it's all downhill so it was a really good place to be at all downhill to seattle well not all downhill to <laughs> seattle but all downhill for one or two days which is all that matters at that time and what are you going up some of these big mountains i mean do you ever do a whole day going uphill yeah um well Pretty much it counts as the whole day. You'll go all the way up and all the way back down, but for some of these mountains, like uh, Washington Pass, which is the last pass we did, it took us about five or six hours to get to the top of. We reached the top by about 7.30 at night, and uh, we went down for about 10 minutes to do, we went down half of the mountain in about 10 minutes and then camped there. So it's kind of, uh, Kind of, I don't know, it's fun at the same time, but then you realize, like, every time you go down, then you probably have to go back up, unfortunately. <laughs> Whatever goes up has to come down. So, blue sky, biking, and a white line down the middle of the road. Uh, this was one of the last days in Montana. It was, um, Montana had pretty much been bad the whole trip, because it was just flat. Well, not flat. It was, uh... It was hilly, but not mountains, so it was uh, just not fun. And then every single day, there was not a single town. It was 70 miles every day. It was 105, 110 degrees, and there just wasn't really anything good about it. But uh, the last three days, where we had Glacier, which was really nice, and then the last three days after Glacier were just these three days where the, it was amazing weather and uh, there was these lakes that we kept on passing that looked like they were the Caribbean and um, we just it was just a great day riding and it made you forget about how far you were going because it really didn't matter because you could do whatever you want and go swimming when you wanted to and just have a good time. And that looks like a basketball on the back of that. Uh, that's Adams, he's the tall kid. Um, he carried the basketball for us a while actually the whole trip but um so that's him and uh he was a good biker and the basketball made it all the way across america yep we uh whenever we got to a basketball goal we'd just pull it out and play for a bit because you don't always find basketballs where you go and there's a picture somewhere of the basketball falling over right of the basketball goal falling over i think maybe yeah okay now is this guy about to jump uh, no, this is Daniel. We uh, This was another one of the lakes so you can see. It looks kind of like a river, but it's just a really, really, really long lake. So it went for miles and miles, and you'd kind of ride right along the edge with uh, a little guardrail between you and a rocky fall. But uh, we'd just ride for the whole day, and it was so nice to look out. So we really didn't like it. This time, you usually, well, by back in uh, the Midwest and stuff, you'd ride get to your campsite so you could hang out for the rest of the day but here you'd only really ride just to enjoy yourself so you really didn't care you wouldn't mind if you got at the campsite at 
like 9 o'clock at night or 7.30 at night or it really didn't matter because it was just so fun to be out there. Wasn't there a spooky story about you were in one lake where uh, you heard news the next day that somebody was found dead in the lake? Um, we, uh, we went, I think it was North Dakota, we were in an Indian reservation and uh, we went swimming in this really gross water one time just because it was 100, that was the day it was 113 degrees outside so we needed something to do and we had a, uh, we'd already got to camp at 9.30 in the morning because we left at 4 so uh, we went swimming and then later the next day we looked at the newspaper and there was a mound found dead in the river just further down. And what was the Indian reservation like? Um, the Indian reservations were really sad to see just because it was in so bad condition that they only really had casinos and gas stations and that was it and then uh, everyone was always drunk or just driving around in sort of like beat up cars and there was glass all over the road and it just wasn't a good place to be. Right, interesting insight into America. Now this is a cool, cool photo. Where is this? Uh, this is actually just further on down the lake. Um, I think just further up the hill is the rock where you just saw Daniel standing on. But uh, me and Daniel were riding and Brian said that he was going to ride down first just so we could take a picture of uh, me and Daniel. I'm in the front and then Daniel's behind me. So he climbed up this rock and told us to ride by and I didn't actually know where he was standing so I thought he was in that rock that I'm right next to but uh, I don't know how he got up there but he came up and took a pretty nice picture. And again where's this? Uh, this is at the last, this is one of the last three days. I think this is the second to last day in Montana around the lakes. Now this is Brian and he looks like he's carrying some extra supplies around his waist there. <laughs> no, that's just wind. Brian's not really large. But uh, um, as you can see one more time, well I needed to get a picture of Brian because you haven't really seen him yet. But uh, um, that's the lake again that we went by and Brian also carried his two huge cameras and a tripod case for his camera and he carried a lot of good stuff. And one of the things that struck me is when people think of bikes and how heavy they are, but a loaded bike is very different to an unloaded bike. Yeah, it's uh, it's the bikes with all the gear ended up weighing about 80 pounds, while they're only about 10, 11, 12 pounds without all the stuff on it. So the stuff weighs a lot, but um, I don't know. It's not as hard as carrying it on your back, but it sure isn't easy. And people, whenever I talk to people about the trip, they always assume that there was a car going along with all the kit and the cameras and the sleeping bags, but obviously there was no car. You carried it all yourself. Yeah, you can see um, those four little bags by the wheels. You just hope you can fit everything in, otherwise you gotta find a, some way or different position to fit it on. And out of interest, did you finish with everything you started with or did you lose some stuff and buy some new stuff? Not at all. Everything either broke or got lost, so it was pretty much everything was new by the end. Road work next 14 miles. So what was going on here? Uh, this was going up top of one of our passes. I think this was our first major pass, so everyone was kind of scared. And uh, about 10 miles from the top we had this sign which meant the road was uh, half gravel, half pavement so um, it wasn't really too fun to ride on especially when you're going uphill so every like fifth turn of the wheel it would sort of skid a little bit and you'd lose some of your speed so it was pretty annoying so I thought I'd get a picture. Any really scary moments about cars going too close or crashes or anything scary? Um, there was plenty of crashes, plenty of cars. I don't know, some people just go by you for no reason. They just feel like, for some reason, seeing you on a bike, you uh, are needed to be honked at or yelled at. So uh, some people just ride by really close to you and yell out the window or something. And uh, some people are just bad drivers, so they feel like they can get between you and the car that's passing on the other side of the road, and even a, though they really can't. And a couple of interventions with some dogs? Oh, uh, yeah, whenever... Um, out in the country, people don't really have those things called invisible fences, which is basically a little electrical fence that keeps your dog in. But uh, So the dogs just pretty much can go free. So um, when we were riding along, a uh, plenty of dogs would come out and just race after you and 
keep getting you, so you get your water bottle and you spray them in the face and then they leave you alone. Spray dogs in the face, I have to remember that. So more cycling, more of what you saw in your uh, in your hours and hours in the saddle. Who are these guys then? Uh, it's in order, it's Daniels, the first person you can see, then Kit with the red bags, and then Adams in the very front with the basketball. And this is just kind of a picture of us riding, sort of what I would see every single day while I'm riding along, talking to everyone, listening to music, and just trying to uh, make it to the next place. And it was just kind of like, it was a really nice weather again, and it was just a great day to be out there. And can you remember your toughest moment when the cycling was getting bad? Uh, yeah, it gets really windy sometimes, and whenever the wind is going against you, it, it just makes you feel bad because you can't go as fast as you feel you should be going, just because by then you feel like you sort of know how fast you should be going on different uh, like level, like different uh, steepnesses and things. But um, So when the wind's out, it really makes it a lot harder to ride. So some of those days where you felt bad already and then the wind was blowing you in the face and you had like 10 miles left, but you know you can only go six miles an hour, sort of makes you feel really bad and you have to really want to go or you're just gonna sit down and not bother. And wasn't there an occasion where you got a bit left behind and your phone didn't work and you ran out of fluids? Yeah, uh, there was one day where I felt really sick and I was the last person and I didn't have batteries so I didn't call, couldn't call anyone and uh, I was just sort of sitting on the side of the road knowing that there's no other way I can get there other than biking so I might as well go but I was so tired and every time I got back on the bike I'd, I don't know I didn't feel like I could go any further so there's plenty of times especially that one where I don't know you didn't you wonder why you're out there and what you could be doing instead well done for making it mate now this looks a little hazardous this looks like a front flip over a bridge into the water um, this is another time where we just sort of find bridges that look really fun to jump off. So uh, me and Chris always were sort of the people that wanted to do it first. So we'd go and test the water. Uh, the water is absolutely freezing. I don't know how. It, it must be glacier runoff water again. But uh, So Chris went down to test it and told it, us it wasn't that cold. But then the first person to jump in found out that it was so cold <laughs> that immediately you hit the water. You wish you didn't jump off and you just swim as hard as you can to the edge. But um, Brian and everyone else caught up with us, so they told us to sort of get some cool pictures for the camera. So uh, I tried to put my arms on the rail and sort of do a handstand over the top, which worked out pretty well, but then I ended up going a little too far, and this is where the famous belly flop occurred. It was very loud, because it's on film, isn't it? Yep, you have to, uh, trying to get it on the online at the moment, and I'll be able to show everyone how good it was later on. Because he sort of had a brief chat with you coming out of the water and you could barely speak. Yeah, I landed directly, sort of perfectly on my side of my stomach and my jaw at the same time. But uh, it was fun. <laughs> now let's see if I get this. Wakanda Pass, is that right? That's correct. Uh, this is the kind of sign that you beg for every single day. Whenever you're going up those passes, you keep every time you sort of turn a corner. Because the passes aren't straight. So uh, you keep taking turns and you look up and you see you trying to look for this sign but then finally when you go you're exhausted but as soon as you see the sign you just refill with energy and you just bike as hard as you can to the top and then throw your bike down and eat some snacks and know that you uh, don't have any more uphill for the day and you can just go all the way back down. So the reason these signs are great news are because it's the top of the hill. Yeah, the uh, pass means they usually have this sign at the very very top telling you that you are you have reached the top and you just climbed a mountain. That's worth bearing in mind. So whenever you see this sign, you know you're at the top of the hill. Very impressive uh, blue sky. You must have seen some wonderful skies. Yeah, this was, uh, we had one day in between all of our mountains where it was only 25 miles and uh, we had an extra day. We'd biked really hard back in, uh, sort of every day counts for something. So if you bike really hard one day, Instead of taking it over two days, you get maybe one day that wouldn't be as hard. So after working hard all across Montana and North Dakota, we got a sort of day off where we only had to do 25 miles. And uh, it was amazing scenery once again with 
mountains on both right and left and the sky was great so as this picture sort of just shows how big everything is like with the sky and how small you feel when you're just riding across this road and everything's around you and you went through one or two storms and tornadoes and dust storms and stuff yeah it's weird it can be a day just like that where you're riding and suddenly you see some clouds and 10 minutes later it's raining so hard that you might as well just sit there and get soaked because there's no point putting on your rain jacket there's no point putting covers over your paneer bags because the rain's so hard that it doesn't even matter you're getting wet no matter what and it was dusty in some places I remember a great photo you took where it appeared to be like a dust storm on the horizon yeah the as you can tell it's not super I don't know, there's not a lot of plants over there, so whenever the wind picks up it just carries whatever on the ground. Right. It doesn't rain that much, but when it does it rains hard. But uh, So all that dust that's just sitting on the top blows all over you and you can't really do anything about it. Right, thank god you only had two t-shirts to get dirty. Now, this appears to be a dead bear. Yeah, uh, this is when we were climbing up our last, final mountain. And um, I guess someone's truck hit someone's bear, and uh, I guess the bear didn't make it through. But uh, we'd always been looking for a bear, and we finally found one, except this one wasn't alive. And I remember you talking about roadkill generally. There's all sorts of things by the side of the road. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know, people just hit things and leave it out there, and there's no sort of animal patrol that come by and pick it up, so the thing's just smells so bad and it's just the most disgusting thing ever when you ride by. You don't even necessarily see it, you'll just be riding and suddenly you get the smell of dead animals which is just awful. And what, what were they? Deer and other stuff? Um, yeah, there was a lot of signs actually that said like um, number of deer killed this year and the amount of uh, money like um, lost by hitting deers so it sort of tell you to slow down due to like $50,000 of lost already this year due to deers or whatever but um I don't know a lot of deers got hit a lot of little animals such as squirrels and raccoons and all those things got hit too but uh it's the first time I saw a bear. Any encounters with frightening animals? Um not really uh we didn't have anything too bad more people that were frightening than animals. <laughs> hear about that in a minute. This is a great photo I love this rehydrating with the uh, winding road in the background. So where's this? This is top of Washington Pass, just around the turn, going up sort of uh, behind where I would be, or, or Brian would be. Um, this is going to the top, and uh, I actually remember going up that turn, if you can see that little car on the road just further down, I. Uh, it was like it got so steep that I just had to sit down and almost passed out because I hadn't had anything to drink in a while and my sugar levels were really low so um, it was that was definitely I'd say one of the hardest parts of the trip for me physically that last turn going up to the top and that was probably one of the biggest accomplishments of the trip because we it was, even though the trip wasn't over that sort of landmark was the space like where you knew you had completed the trip because it was the last mountain, the highest mountain and the biggest mountain. So it really was sort of up here, the final, you've completed biking across America. And it seems like because the Cascades were so challenging and they were on the west side, it was good that you went sort of east to west? Yeah, I don't think there's any way we would have been able to make it west to east. Um, I remember having hard times in Pennsylvania mountains and you think about that now and it's like that's no way that'd be any trouble. But I think partly we physically grew better at biking but also we learned how to bike when it's so tough and when you're at the bottom of something that's this long you know it's 10 miles of straight uphill which is going to take you another 6-7 hours. You just have to forget about it and listen to music and just know that you'll get to the top whenever you get to the top and not really worry about it. Now you averaged 70 miles a day and you started off in Pennsylvania sort of 30-40 miles on the first few days. What's the most miles you did in a day? Um, we did I think 95-96 miles one day and it was about 100 degrees that day. We started off at about 
five, six o'clock, and we ended up at 5.30, 6.30. And uh, it was one of the hardest days ever. It was actually Brian's birthday. So I guess instead of us doing playing pranks on him, he just wanted to tire us out, tire us out so much that we wouldn't be able to do anything. But uh, that was the longest day we got to do. Very smart. Now again, we think of the tour, or I do anyway, as being really, really hot. You look actually pretty chilly here. Yeah, we uh, Washington Pass, which you saw in the last picture, we camped at the very top of, and uh, so the next day we'd have all downhill sort of uh, to our next town, and then after that town we were in Anacortes. But uh, when you wake up on top of these mountains, as you can see, there are snow, so, uh, well, there is snow, but um, you, uh, it is pretty cold, and when you're going down a mountain at 30, 40 miles an hour with the wind, it just goes through any piece of clothing you have. So you just put on every single thing you have and uh, sort of beg to get to the bottom. It was kind of tough because whenever you go up, you beg to be going down, but when you're going down, it's so cold that you just wish you were going flat. But uh, when it warms up, it's really fun, but when it was cold, it just sort of like cut through your body. <laughs> And so when you're going downhill, because you're not expending energy, you, you feel colder. Yeah, well, it is colder than, because usually when we were going, the hardest parts of the mountain would be at about anywhere from midday to five o'clock, which is when it was hottest. So, uh, but when you're going down, this would be about 7 a.m. in the morning, and uh, you would only have to pedal a couple times unless you wanted to go as fast as you possibly could, but uh, I don't know, it just was really, really cold. And you must have had this kit in your bike, on your bike all the time, and you just didn't use it that often. Yeah, Brian always told us, like, we'd always wonder why we had this stuff, and he'd just say, when you get to the Cascade, you'll want it, and we definitely did. So this was one that I was there for. In fact, I think I took this. So this is arriving in Anacortes on the west coast and dipping the tires in the water. Tell us, tell us how this felt. It was really weird. It was, I didn't. It didn't feel like how I ex uh, expected it to be. It was. Uh, I don't know. It was such a big trip with such a big beginning, and the whole thing took so long. It was two months of just biking every single day that you never really knew what it was going to be like to get to the end, and you always wondered what it'd be like. But then you didn't know whether you wanted it or not wanted it to be at the end. So it was sort of a weird feeling. And when we were finally there, you would think about it, and you think about all the hours that you thought about being at this exact point and it just felt weird because I don't know it was actually happening it's kind of like something you dream about your whole life and then it finally happens and you don't know how to react so it really did take a while for it to set in to, for you to like realize that you're not biking across the country anymore but it was a great feeling at the same time to know that I've actually done it and now as soon as I put my front tire in that water I could say I had biked across the country. I remember the next couple of days uh, referring to the bike trip in the past tense and you saying you don't want to think it's over, you, wanna, you don't want to talk about the bike trip that was, you want to talk about the bike trip that is because we still hadn't come back to rally. Yeah, um, I don't know, just like saying it was over almost felt like, I don't know, it was almost saying like one of your best friends is gone or like left you, so it's kind of, I don't know, it, it was hard. You didn't know what to say or how to talk about it. And you'd always talk about things that happened like a couple of weeks ago. And then you'd be like, oh, well, it's still going. Maybe it'll happen again or something. But you really knew like at the end of this, everything was done and it was over with. And very difficult question. And I know people must ask you this, but people are astonished by the whole trip. And people ask me about how you feel about achieving such a tremendous feat. I mean. What do you say to those people when they say that? Um, it still really surprises me. Like, I'll be at school, sort of like now, and I'll be walking around and I'll be thinking about the bike trip, and then I'll be like, wow, I actually did that whole bike trip. And it still sort of surprises me, thinking that I actually did it, and it's still not upcoming, or I'm still not about to go on it, or that I've actually done it. So, I don't know, it's still weird to think about, but uh, I don't know. It was, what, it was the best thing I've ever done and, I don't know, went perfectly. And I'll tell you what, mate, when I was uh, stood on that beach as you came cycling down the hill and driving into the water, there was a, 
a little tear in your daddy's eye. So I can tell you, it was a marvellous moment for me and you made a lot of people really proud. So uh, thank you for doing that and um, well done. There's a lot of people who are very proud on your behalf and we love you to pieces, mate. Thank you.